I'm proud of one thing that we shared. I, I didn't even go and look at all his background. But I'll tell you one thing. This is another old Peace Corps moment. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff was in the hall. And, uh, and he's got a bunch of girls that are running fools, <coughs> daughters. And, uh, and he's a good guy. He's been here, what, about eight years? Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Time goes by. We're going to have fun. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to let Jeff then take you on a tour, his tour, of the Zumal Bird. So, Rich, I think, so my Peace Corps group was number 169, not any other former Peace Corps volunteers who we know they number sequentially all the groups. I was 169 in Nepal. I think we were maybe one, group one. <laughs> I was nine in Turkey, number nine in Turkey, and we got kicked out after about 19. <laughs> well, I'm humbled by the turnout, and it's nice to see everybody here, and thank you for, um, thank you for your interest in this. This is a pretty um, unique presentation in my experience, just to be surrounded by all of the artwork, the poetry, the prose, photography, painting that was created out there this spring. I think it was June 16th we had everybody out, and the artists had another 10 days or so to uh, finish their work, get it turned into the Giuseppe Center, and they got uh, Ellen Bishop curated the show, and all thanks to Cheryl and her crew for having a brainstorm and idea and making it happen. So um, with that, I'm going to start out today, well, let me say this. Um, my thought for the next 45 minutes or so is for me to talk at you for probably 15, 20 minutes, um, and then open it up for questions. And I, if, if we don't have questions, if people don't want to have conversation, I can throw some more pictures up and we can stimulate conversation that way to run out of the hour. But um, that's my plan for the hour. Um, and I'm going to start us in this, this hour with a little bit of a different tack than what you see surrounding you here today. I'm going to talk about um, the sort of thought process of conservation on the prairie, how the Nature Conservancy approaches it, how we approached it in the past, and sort of a little snapshot of history, pushing forward to where we are today and where we're going over the next few years. Um, first credit to Rick McEwen. Among other many other great photographs, this was one he shot and sent over to me. This is taken from the from the West Findlay View. If you can know where that is, looking to the northeast. So you've got uh, on the flank of the view, and then you've got Hartshorn View, a little symmetrical hill, and looking out across the small prairie towards the Imnaha Canyon. So uh, to set, set the scene a little bit on the Nature Conservancy's work on the prairie, the, the slide shown here, this genie lamp shaped blob, is what we call our Zumwalt Prairie Conservation Site. And what we tried to do with that was capture within that boundary all of the historic grasslands of north of the Lyle Mountains, so these native Pacific Northwest bunchgrass prairies. In dark green are um, what had been Nature Conservancy holdings as of about the year 2000, I think it's about 2006. Um, Clear Lake Ridge Preserve was, we don't get a lot of airtime for that property, but it's a beautiful, amazing property up on, on Clear Lake Ridge that was purchased in the mid 1980s in three different parcels. The Zumwalt Prairie Preserve was first purchased in the year 2000, 27,000 acres, and followed up in 2006 with another 6,000 acres. So that's what that bigger green blob is off to the northeast, and that's really the, uh, our core land ownership at this, to this day uh, in Mojave County. Um, but we've always had an ambitious vision and a conservation vision for the prairie as a whole, not simply what the conserv conservancy owns. Excuse me. Um, and that vision is built on a community-based strategy where we don't think we need to own it all, we don't want to own it all, we, we I don't think it would be desirable for us to own it all. Um, but we want to see good things happen across all of what's left of the native grassland. And 
and, and we come to that vision because this really is the last best remnant of Pacific Northwest bunchgrass prairie, which by most estimates covered roughly 6 million acres uh, before most of the the peas, lentils, wheat, barley, you know, the bluest part of Washington and Idaho. Uh, think about a lot of the landscapes near Hermiston and Pendleton, the grasslands that are there. Um, very similar in type to what we now have on Zumo. This didn't go that same route primarily because it's higher, colder, and drier than those other areas with similar uh, plant species composition. So our vision has stayed the same, but our, our tactics have changed over the years. Um, and about six or seven years ago, we changed direction a little bit and really started reaching out and touching base with a lot of our private land neighbors. That's another point worth making, I think. When you look at that blob in the center of the map, and you can see the shading on it, um, public land, this kind of grayish color. There's public land, but the prairie itself, um, all the way from Tick Hill through the Leap Country up to the North Zumwalt, is essentially privately owned. And that informed the strategy as well. So we started reaching out to these folks that own large chunks of the prairie and tried to understand what their issues were, what their problems were, and where we might be able to fit in and help be part of the solution. Um, you know, and, and it's, been a, it's been a great journey in that respect, and I'll touch more on that in, in a couple of minutes. So we started reaching out to these privately, private landowning neighbors, understanding that um, we thought we had something we could bring to the table and we thought we had some things we could learn from them. But we also had a couple of other challenges that were coming to the fore at the same time. As I mentioned, we bought the second portion of the Zumwalt Prairie Preserve in, in the year 2006. And you know, buying land, especially at scale, is an expensive endeavor, and Nature Conservancy typically gets a fairly large proportion of public funds to do that. There's various programs out there. Um, I believe the 6,000 acres that were west of the Zumwalt Road were funded primarily with Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board money, monies. So um, this is the lottery funds that get sent to schools, parks, and conservation work. Um, the Oregon State Lottery. And we were able to do that, but every one of the applications for public monies goes through a fair bit of public review process, right? And it, some of it's from our elected officials, county commissioners, um, state representatives, state legislatures. Um, and if you're looking at federal monies, then the, the federal delegation can get involved as well. So there's both and then there's also usually public comment periods where the general public can come in and, and comment on projects. So we were facing some pretty stiff headwinds, both financially and politically, if we were expecting to go on a continued path of acquisition and ownership and management by the Nature Conservancy. So you throw all those things together, and we realized that um, that wasn't a viable path for us. We were presented with an opportunity back in about 2013 when a landowner with roots in the area really wanted to move back. Um, he had interest in buying a big portion of what some of you may know as the Buckhorn Ranch that Gene and Sue Gertzen owned for 10, 12 years. They eventually owned a 38,000 acre ranch on the Zumwalt. And um, they, had, they had some life changes and they were in the phase where they were gonna sell that. Um, Dan, Dan and Susie Probert were the folks. Um, Dan grew up here. Um, in fact, his father, Jim Probert, sold us one of the parcels that became the Clear Lake Ridge property. Um, but as Dan is, will point out to you, if you ask him, when his father sold to the Conservancy, it was an economic duress sale. He didn't really want to sell. I mean, he wasn't forced to sell to the Conservancy, but he didn't want to sell, but it was the mid-80s, early 80s, and things were really, really tough in agriculture. When Dan came back, it was a partnership that he wanted to, to uh, have with the Nature Conservancy, and that was a big difference. And he saw us as being part of the solution for him. This is Dan 
um, in the photo in the lower right, and of course Rob Taylor, many, many of you know in the upper right, who's our uh, former ecologist on the project for many years. But yeah, Dan and Susie came back, they wanted to come back, they wanted to buy a portion of the buckhorn, but it wasn't possible without some additional funding. And that's where, in terms of tactics, the Nature Conservancy, we started getting really active in the idea of conservation easements as, as a tactic to get to land conservation. Um, and Dan and Susie have been great partners in that. They had their eye on a 12,000 acre parcel um, on the zoom wall that lies right about here. And it's the old Walter Brennan Ranch, you can know it as the Light Creek Ranch, which you know, before the Gertsons had it. Um, beautiful piece of property. Amazing resources, both for prairie, canyons. Uh, it's got historical, cultural artifacts on it. It's got old stone quarry. It's got amazing wildlife. It's got some steelhead in the lower reaches of Lightning Creek until it gets that little reservoir dam, I believe. So it's got some fisheries and aquatic, um, aquatic avian life. It's got nesting, peregrine falcons, and, and on and on. Um, so that was our approach, but our challenge was to figure out how to do this conservation easement in a way that met Dan and Susie's production goals, because they're, they're in it for ranching and, and to make a living as ranchers. They're, it's not a hobby ranch. It's not something they have the funds just to buy it, sit on it, use it for recreational purposes. They're going to use it for production and agriculture. Of course, Nature Conservancy's mission of conservation of biodiversity, protecting land and waters that we all depend upon, um, is, is where we're coming at it from. So the big challenge was, can we bring those two things together in a coherent whole that works for both parties? We reached out to many of our Nature Conservancy colleagues. Um, yeah, sorry, ignore you back there. I know what you look like. <laughs> um, and ask them what have they done? We've been particularly in the front range of, of, uh, of the Rockies. We've got uh, chapters of the Conservancy that have done fairly large scale conservation easements, you know, ranch size. And ask them, well, how have you done this? Do we have to reinvent the wheel? Why do we need to? And what do we do to make an effective conservation easement that works for conservation and production? And to our surprise, we found that. Um, Really, we were in a position where we had to kind of start from scratch because most of, at least, actually all of those projects that we looked at on the front range of the Rockies or even in California were in a situation where they didn't really care what sort of grazing management happened. They called them green side up easements. As long as it wasn't plowed or converted to, uh, to home sites and subdivision, they were happy. Those were grasslands that evolved with, as you can imagine, big, you know, millions of pounds per acre at times of, of livestock grazing or bison grazing, I should say. And so the, the whole community of grasses and the ecosystem was just very different than our bunch grass prairies. Not that we didn't have bison here, not that we didn't have bighorn sheep, elk, et cetera, but we didn't have the huge herds, didn't have the big numbers, didn't have the same impacts, and, and the, both the the ecology of, the, of this grass species is just very different. There's a lot more rhizomatous grasses, you know, grasses that spread through tillering and, and form a, a mat of sod. And where we are dominated by bunch grasses, which as the name suggests, they're, they reproduce from seed, they, uh, they grow in a bunch, there's a lot of open space between individual plants, and they're just very different ecological systems. Um, so what did we do? We started out, um, we knew we couldn't rush into this. We knew we didn't know exactly whether we could get to a, a, a good place or not. So we worked with Dan and Susie and his family to try to put together a management plan that answered these three questions. And we, in fact, did this. We had started talking about a conservation easement, but we put this management plan together with them a full two years before an easement was recorded. And Dan and Susie managed to that plan for two years before there was any formal legal obligation on either party to do one thing or another. And that was really, that was really key. Um, 
to, keep, to answer these questions, let me back up just a little bit, to answer these questions, it wasn't just Dan and Susie in the room. They brought in their extended family. They brought in their kids. They brought in some of their peers in the ranching community that they trusted. And, and you know, Dan is a member of Country Natural Beef. He brought in some of the uh, some of his colleagues from Country Natural Beef that he, he respects, and had all these people in the room to help talk through and figure out if we could come to a common vision on these, these types of questions. Um, we had the meeting facilitated by another fellow I respect greatly named Jack Southworth out of Bear Valley in uh, Grant County. And he's also a, he's a rancher by trade, but he's also a very good facilitator by, by training. And um, he did a great job helping us work through these, these issues. So, but the devil's in the details, of course, and we put together, as part of that Midway Barn management plan, of which Lightning Creek is a part, we put in a whole variety of goals and objectives and indicators, as any, as any good planner will do, as any land manager will do, you know. Um, we talk a lot about land management planning, and there's a lot of things that a lot of different ways to do it, but at the heart of it, what it takes is a commitment to uh, to be observant, to set some goals that you can put down on paper so that you can come back and remember what they were a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. Go back and look at them and say, did we meet them? If, if yes, why? If, if not, why not? Right? And here's a summary, and, and, and so we put this man monitoring and management plan together and we have an annual meeting with the programs every year. And some of that monitoring is stuff that Dan and Susie do, some of it's stuff that the Nature Conservancy does. We come together once a year and I'm not going to go into the details here. I probably, I know I don't remember every objective and every indicator, but we have an annual meeting to see where we're doing on those, on those counts. Um, and that, that's just really, really a critical piece of it. And the specifics of this slide on, the, on your left is essentially uh, illustrating a riparian stubble height results for the areas that Dan is managing. Um, we set a stubble height standard of greater than four inches in these riparian areas, and I have to say the riparian areas for the most part are intermittent ephemeral stream channels. Um, lower Lightning Creek here is perennial, but that's outside of their standard grazing area, so we didn't measure stubble height there. So these are, these are primarily, you know, they'll see water flowing in the maybe three months a year, three, four months a year typically. But still, having an adequate stubble height is an important part to um, capture sediment, to prevent erosion, to create habitat for the, the insects and other things that you know really thrive in that environment, to create bird nesting habitat and so forth and so on. And to some extent, the condition of your riparian areas, which are the most desirable by livestock, can tell you something about the condition of the rest of the, of the upland areas as well. Um, so in this case, I think in 2017, Dan and Sue just sort of barely met their stubble height standards. So they're, they're okay, they're not knocking it out of the park, but they're, um, they're, they're working on it. And, they're, and, and the other thing this does is it gives us a bit of a roadmap of where we might focus on as we you know, as he builds his next year's grazing plan. So you could look at that and like, I'm looking at that one there's a green dot and there's three yellow and one red. Right here. It's yeah. like a red spot is your hot spot where you would maybe focus some efforts on changing. Potentially, right. although is that what you're saying? you'd have to look at context as okay. well, right? Um, because there's a lot of variation along that line of the stream channel, you get up in some of these places and they may not even be able to support a 
pouring stuff like that. It might be mostly cobble and rock and a little bit of cheap grass, and that's about all it's going to be. Uh, other areas are pretty lush, and so, but it's, it's a place to start asking the question next, right? What's going on there? The other thing on this particular map is um, the AD per acre refers to animal days per acre, which is a, a, a metric of how intensively an area is grazed. So it's color coded on the map by pasture, and then if you were to squint closely, you can see what the actual number is 18.5 here, 7.6. So within those categories, what the actual um, grazing pattern was. Um, and this map doesn't say anything about what time of year or how long of duration the grazing was, but that's other information that we also collect. Um, so I'll move on from there to, to say that, you know, um, working with Dan and Susie was our first conservation easement on the Zumwalt Prairie. Mm -hmm. It's shown here in, in this 12,000 acres that ties and connects to Clear Lake Ridge. Uh, and is only a, a quarter mile or so from the southern boundary of the Zumwalt Prairie Preserve. Uh, it happens to be, I believe, the largest agricultural conservation, conservation easement in the state. Um, we couldn't have asked for a better first partner than Dan and Susie to get things started because they're very very active, very curious, very motivated to work with us, right? And not just give a lip service. Um, they did get some payment for that easement, but they also donated some amount of money back to help set up the stewardship endowment, and they also gave a bit of a bargain sale on the, on the price of the easement. So they certainly got something that helped their bottom line, but they, they're active uh, and good partners as well. This slide up here is just to sort of give a forecast of what might happen over the next few years. Um, we've got Jeff, just for kind yeah. of put it in perspective, so how many cows are grazing, are they grazing approximately? So Proberts on the lands that they manage, which includes, includes a chunk right here. Okay includes this chunk right here, as well as the Lightning Creek. So they're grazing on about 18,000 acres, and they have about 650 pair of cattle. Okay. And they don't spend year-round on it. They, right. Dan sends cattle to the Boardman area, to the John Day area, to Adel. Yeah. He's got, in, in the winter months, okay. and things aren't quite so hospitable up here. But, uh, but so that's <coughs> grazing, 650 pair. Um, so we've got some opportunities, and in the works right now, here on the left, you may recognize Tyson McLaughlin, a local boy who's our contract herdsman. We, we've had him on for nine, 10 years. He's Burrow and Marianne's son. Uh, does a really good job for us. But looking to the future, we're looking at, you know, currently, this year, we're hoping to bring about seven to 10,000 acres um, of additional lands under easement, and we have another 8,500 acres queued up for the year after that. Um, so we're excited about the strategy. We think it's we've got good partners to work with, and um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to share that little snapshot with you of where we think we're headed in the future. Um, we. Before I, before I end, though, I guess I want to go back to, and I, I won't end actually quite yet, I want to switch gears, though, and go back to this first slide and um, say a, a couple words about why I titled this presentation, Every Day It Happens. And I took that, I stole that, actually, that title from this chapbook, which is was put together by the Fish Trap Outpost. Um, I think most of you know Fish Trap. Most of you know their summer summer Fish Trap series. They come out to the Zumwalt Prairie to our property every year and have for the past five, six years anyhow to run their, their outpost section of summer fish trap. And um, they bring a, an instructor. They bring eight to 12 writers. Um, they spend a week out there. Janet, another. Janet's been a naturalist for them for years. 
Um, they get great food, they get great naturalist services, and they get instruction on writing and how to sort of deepen their artistic side. And I, the title that I stole just struck me because I do a fair amount of office work. Other people do other things out there. But really, this landscape is so dynamic. And there's always something going on out there. And most of it, frankly, most of it, us humans are not really guiding. We're, we're just sort of creeping around the edges, right? But every day, all kinds of stuff is happening out there. The, the life that's at work and the ecological process that's at work out there is, is astounding to me. Um, while I still have the floor, I want to read just a few things on this. This is the 2017 chapbook from Fish Trap Outpost. And I've thrown a bunch of facts and figures at you today, and it's kind of the world I live in, and it, it represents my experience of the prairie in large part because I typically approach this through maybe personality, but also my my work. It's a very workmanlike approach to the prairie, and I'm a very sort of literalist thinker about what we have going on. Um, the words represented, the words in this book and, and, and represented around the room here, bring a much different perspective, which is hugely valuable. And um, I'd like to just read a few things from, from this. And I think maybe I'll, I'll read a little bit from this, this first one. I don't think I'll read the, the whole, and I'll skip to the second one. Um, Start from the start here. As I gave, and this is for a, an essay called Fences by Dick Corey. As I gazed down at Hell's Canyon, I pondered what brought all of us here. Thirteen writers from different walks of life had spent the last week looking for inspiration from this Zumwalt prairie. Had we found it? This country has few fences. Most just separate the open range of the prairie from the roads of travel. Maybe that's what many of us were looking for, an easement from the shackles of urban life. As our leader, Craig Childs, said, it was impossible to totally free our thoughts from our routines and absorb the prairie. I kept thinking of the radar clock speeding ticket I got on the way here. Perhaps the most we could hope for was to gain a glimpse of nature as we strained to stretch the barbs of constraint. Um, my own fences were largely physical and psychological. Would I be able to endure the hikes? I wanted to experience as much as possible without slowing down my fellow writers. We often rose with the sun and watched the moon creep up from the horizon. We were not exclusively diurnal or nocturnal, we were both. The name for this I later found is Cat Emerald, a midday nap and delicious cowboy food kept us going. Possibly this change in our biologic rhythms was planned to help us get in tune with the Earth. Our leader kept talking about seeking alignments. Perhaps we were also seeking to change the misalignments of habits that keep us from being in balance with nature. So then, um, Searching for Answers by Colleen Minya Sperry. As the warm evening light caresses the velvet green brown hills, our outpost group sets off along the dirt track, winding up the slope to the northeast of summer camp. We follow each other like a disjointed flock of geese. Not as graceful as a murmuration of starlings. We have just met. We are not one yet, but we are guided by one. Craig Childs. A gentle tailwind encourages our climb. It holds my hand as I nervously progress. I fondle my wooden name tag and put one foot in front of the other, burdened by my camera, tripod, and a clinging past that won't get off my back. When we reach the top of the hill after walking less than a half a mile up the gradual incline, Craig and Kim stop. 
I arrive next and walk into a conversation about where the moon might come from. As I approach them, I slyly smile. I have an answer. Colleen says, you know, I have an app on my phone in my pocket that will tell me exactly where the sun will set and the moon will rise. I say to my friends. The photographer's ephemeris is an app I use religiously to help me line up photographic compositions in harmony with Mother Nature's light. Yeah, well, I bet the sun's going to set right there, says Craig, pointing to the glowing orb about to kiss the horizon. And he flashes a jolly smile through his salt and pepper beard that has no doubt listened to thousands of answers. Well, yes, of course, I say with a chuckle. But you know what? I'm, but you know what? I'm not going to look. I say. I put my hand in my pocket. I'm not going to do it because of what you said earlier. What did he say? Kim asks. He said he arrives at a place intentionally not knowing. I say. He lets the land reveal itself. All my life, I have looked for answers. What sports should I play? What should I wear to fit in with the cool kids? What college should I attend? What should I major in? What should I do when I grow up? Assuming that ever happens. And after the last two years, what did I do so wrong to have my best friend and husband give up on me without warning? Why won't he talk with me about anything? Is he ever coming home? Who am I? Where do I belong? Why am I here? The answers have seared in my pocket all along. The thing is, even if I look, what would I do with them? I'd still live in my house with my cat. I'd still try to feed myself. I'd still dance in the kitchen. I'd still go on road trips and marvel at beautiful places and things. And I'd still stand at the top of the road with the other outpost participants and Craig waiting for the full moon to rise right where it's supposed to, like a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so it was interesting, as I was reading the other day through this particular version of the chat book, um, and I've got four or five other editions of it here, it just struck me that, you know, I, I stop in and I visit with these writers every year when they're out there. And I blow in and I spend two, two and a half hours with them chatting. And they have a lot of questions about the nuts and bolts and the minutia of what goes on on the prairie and what the conservancy is up to. And I share some of what I talked about earlier. Um, but I, it, I really don't spend much time learning what they're doing there. I just sort of assume that they were there because they were writers honing their craft. And what I took away from this little chapbook was that mostly their people looking to try to figure out what in the world is going on and how is it, what's their place in it. And this place, uh, you know, hugely important, not just this place, but this is one of the places where people can go to try to figure that out. And that's one of the services I think um, I'm happy that as an organization we can help provide. Um, And then, if you'll indulge me one more, there's a poem that Jenner Hanny wrote. You know Jenner? Um, I didn't ask permission for any of these books, but since they published these things. <laughs> um, and it's just it's, it's a great poem, and it's, it's not super long, but I'd love to share it with you as a conversation. So this one's titled, In the Desert, You Saw Something That Brought You Back to Life by Jenner Hanny. My early life was characterized by erasure and invisibility. My successes were a threat, so I was silenced, disparaged, and dismissed. It wasn't safe to share my stories. I still wrote them, couldn't help but observe, interpret, and record. Then filed those stories away in boxes on the shelves of my mind and body, and carried them all with me, ever heavier, stooping under their weight. I consulted the internal card catalog when I pulled out the credit card for Outpost. Dusted off and lifted the cardboard flaps on 84. In the circle of chairs, feeling safe or reckless, I reviewed their contents, tasted the shape of words I'd only ever recited to myself. I told the stories and then I let them go. I saw the stories reflected in my listeners, felt them leave me, passing beyond summer camp out onto the open prairie. Most receded like the hawk fading away. 
but I saw something in a few that I liked very much. I reached to collect those few stories and cupped careful poems like they were butterflies, like they were crane flies. I let these keepers breathe in the open country, mingle with their story brethren. Then I placed them carefully back in a box, just one, and replaced that box on spacious open shelves. I feel like I cleaned a deep wound left behind a great weight on the Zoom Prayer. Yeah. Um, I stop. And uh, I brought, like I say, four or five other editions of, of other prior groups for Outpost and uh, to circulate those around and take a read on them, or, or I think Fish Trap could probably set me up with additional copies as well. Um, that's all I had formally to share, so I'd be happy to take any questions or have some conversation. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, Mike. Go ahead. Jeff, what you said and what, uh, what this show has done has caused me to very much think that this is not only another home run for the Giuseppe Center and for the artists here, but it's totally out of the park. And you see that not so much in the exhibit here, but you see it in that monogram that goes with this. That book should be put in every library and every around the country because it is truly uh, a great study in the question of who we are, where we fit in, and Prairie explaining it to us. So I urge everybody to get a copy of that book and keep it around. If you don't get it now, you'll get it later. And I mean the word get. you repeat the sure. uh, she's asking if there's a couple of three lessons that I've learned through this last number of years working with conservation easements uh, well so first first lesson I think I touched on I said you know we ran into some headwinds financially and politically to acquiring and buying more land so to some extent uh, easements were a tactic of pragmatism right because that's where we to go. So I was surprised, or I was pleasantly surprised, to learn um, how much richer the conversation has become. You know, we approach it, we've got some expertise on our staff. We've got a staff of about five people locally. Um, people have worked in conservation, some of them a long time, some of them you know, earlier in their career, but quite a bit of expertise. Uh, but we approach it from a certain perspective and filter, and when we start talking and working with the ranchers that have been doing this for their whole lives and careers, it just makes it a richer stew. So that's been a nice, pleasant surprise. Uh, second lesson I would say is, you know, we buy a conservation easement, there's a lot of legal and there's tens and dozens of pages, and there's management plans, and there's this and there's that. And in total, it runs, it can run to hundreds of pages of documentation and legal ease. But what we're really buying with that easement is a forever conversation. Right? We have a seat at the table with them. We have a shared set of long-term goals, which includes economic viability and ecological uh, sustainability. And we're going to work together to figure out how, whether it's with the current landowner or the subsequent landowners, because these are not expiring easements. These are forever easements. You know, we have a seat at the table, and we'll continue to Jeff, just to kind of set some baselines again, I, I remember somebody telling me how many how many plant species there were in a square meter out there. Kind of just roughly, how many? What are the plant communities, the animal communities, the insect communities? Yeah. How rich is it? What are what are we look, talking about out there on that? Well, it's surprisingly rich. Surprisingly, at least for someone like me who grew up. Not knowing much about prairies and went to school as a forester and worked in different projects. But at this point, we're close to 550 vascular plant species in our herbarium. Uh, 
over 100 species of native bees, and when they've done the native bee survey or the bee survey work, they haven't found any European honeybee out there. It's all native bees. Uh, wow. 50, at least 50, I'm sure more species of, uh, of butterfly and moth, Lepidoptera. Um, almost 20, when I count raptors and, and including the owls, we've got nearly 20 different species of raptors that call the prairie home. Everything from occasional snowy owls that come down from the Arctic for the summer to uh, occasional gear, gear falcons, um, kestrels, which are really probably thick out here today in the late summer. So, no, no, no. Um, mammals, you know, um, abundant elk herd. Uh, bears, we've seen bears on the prairie, which is quite a sight to see. Great occasional use by wolves, uh, cougar, bobcat. We don't have, we've got bighorn sheep on our property because about half of the conservancy stuff is actually fairly ribby and candy. Uh, but we don't have grizzly, we don't have grizzly bear. Uh, I think that's the only native large mammal that's you know, from post glacial that's missing. Right? Okay, occasional moose, one that's through occasional pronghorn. So we're diminished in pronghorn numbers for sure. There's no resident pronghorn. And our white-tailed jackrabbit population might be gone. I don't know. I haven't seen it in a long time. What are their motives? Oh gosh. Um, well, they're motives? Sort of a, a keystone rodent is the Belding's ground squirrel, which is a primary prey for a lot of the raptors. Although I've seen kestrels probably feast more on Mormon crickets than on um, lots of voles and mice and pocket gophers and badgers. Uh, not quite a rodent, I guess, but they're an amazing badger density out there. Coyotes, of course. Fishes. What species? Species? Well, you know better than me, but I think my understanding is we have we have spawning steelhead, we have resident rainbow uh, as a consequence of that, uh, occasional juvenile chinook use, maybe an occasional bull trout, pull the tools up Camp Creek in the colder part of the year. Dace uh, sculpin. Uh, what's the what's the, the sucker? Long nose. Long nose. Uh, I'm thinking of a said white fish. Not white. Should be white. Not white fish. Really have that in the lower reach. Not, I'm not positive about that. Jim and his crew have been. Uh, they're great partners in monitoring the fishery in Lower Camp Creek, which is a, actually. The index or an index stream for steelhead spawning in the Naha watershed. So I think they've been doing annual red counts for steelhead there since 1965. Great resource. Jeff, are there more raptors out there in the summertime than in the wintertime? I heard maybe in the winter the raptors all moved to town. There, yeah, there, 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 there are more raptors. I mean, several, several of the species are migratory, so summer is your time. Um, the Bruginous hawks go south. Um, the Goldens go south, probably to some extent, Janet. And they don't stay around and move around, they don't really eat. Um, our red tails are maybe a little more resident. <coughs> By February, they're back on the nest. They get out there occasionally. See the red tail hawk. So, <laughs> getting snowed on. The advantage and disadvantage of grazing on the Zumal? Hmm? The advantage, that's a great question. Uh, the advantage, well, when you say the Zumal, are you talking about nature conservancy specifically? Yes. yes. Or, okay. The advantage, so, the advantage for us, the primary driver is, again, going back to our, our conservation vision or goal, which is to see good things happen across the prairie. And nearly all of that private landscape is grazed. So we entered it from a perspective of saying, uh, we need to know something about grazing. And the good, the bad, the benign, the 
really nasty practices and the, the, the more compatible practices so that we can uh, have a seat at the table and have some influence on, as I showed you on that last slide, the bigger landscape. Um, we do use it as a tool to try to, you know, all ecosystems need some disturbance mechanism. And in grasslands, it's typically herbivory and fire. So we do try to use it as a tool to, to be one of those disturbance mechanisms. The downside is you always have rough spots. There's always um, there's concentrated use zones. There's fences. That's probably the biggest thing. Uh, there's animals that keg up around water sources and, and you know, salt grounds and corners. And, and um, yeah, I think there, there's an impact, particularly if the grazing is there can be an association between grazing and weeds, right? You know, there's, that's an issue to manage. Um, so that's, I think if, if, not, if we were only interested in what that patch of prairie that we own looks like and how it functions, the easiest thing to do would be to get rid of the livestock herd and only have a prescribed fire program, a weed program, and elk management. Uh, but our vision is, is bigger than that, and frankly, partly informed by my, by my time overseas and the Peace Corps and other places, I think for most parts of the world, having complete sort of segregated uh, human use and a non-human use type of segregation is, is just not a viable model for conservation. So we need to figure out how to do conservation with people, because we're, we're everywhere. So that's what I see as the, as the bigger problem with that. So if you check for the fire that you've done, the prescriber or anything yeah. done, do you have any indications, conclusions of what effects you're mm -hmm. seeing? So, um, yeah, Prairie is a historically fire adapted system. The Nest First, the records that they burnt on their part of their management of the prairie. Um, you tend to get a nice flush. So when you burn, what happens? You darken the soil surface. You get rid of a lot of uh, senescent biomass. You kind of open things up. Um, for the most part, the grass plants, their growing tips are not at the very tip of the plants, down near the root, uh, root mass. So a fire moving through the prairie typically burns cool enough that it doesn't kill a lot of those grass plants and like knock them back a little bit. But, so you, let's say we burn in the fall, uh, you've got a soil surface that is going to warm up earlier in the spring, right? So you get earlier sprouting, typically. Um, you get a flush of the flowering plants, typically, and, and it, sometimes that can just be they're more numerous. In other cases, it can be they're taller and more vigorous as well. But you know, for the pollinators and the, all the, the nectar-loving creatures out there, which are part of that food web, uh, that's a, that's a big boost. The other thing it does is, given our grazing patterns, we tend to graze at relatively low stock densities on our property. When we do that, um, number one, our lessees are always really happy because they know they're going to have high-quality pastures to go into, but a lot of uh, livestock, you know, they'll come back and they'll preferentially hit the same plant repeatedly, right? They don't have to, a cow doesn't have to stick its nose into a bristly old decadent bunch grass. It's going to pick the thing that's maybe just got that fresh growth on it. Over time, you can get in that feedback loop where certain plants are really you know, overgrown or wolfy in some people's eyes, and other plants are getting more grazed, more regularly. So fire can kind of reset that, wipe that clean, and then you get every plant coming back up at this, you know, it's kind of a reset. Um, there's also nutrients out of the universe. So, uh, yeah. Now, typically what we see after fire is you get back what you had. Makes sense, right? With, if you had annual grasses and weed, weeding annual grasses, you get a lot of weeding annual grasses back. Yeah, pure bunch grass, native species will tend to get that back. However, um, 
it's, it's no longer quite that simple, I don't think. We're in an era of changing plant composition out there, new novel species like Bentonata and Medusa Edrai, relatively novel, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, changing climate, different precip patterns, and so forth, where we can't make the assumption that just because fire had perpetuated this prairie in the past, that if we burn today, we're going to absolutely get good stuff back, right? So we need to study that more. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, I was wondering about, um, so when I was looking at the, I think it was like the third slide, you had sort of um, a puzzle piece of, of, of things that you were measuring and there were, there were like, you know, you had your red. I was wondering if you could talk about, like, it sounds to me like there's qualitative measures and quantitative measures, but you also have that moment where you've got to sit down at the table and have a conversation right. and how that evolves over time, that sort of moral, is this is this favorable versus unfavorable? What is your view and our view, and, mm -hmm. and how that develops with the landowner over time? So the way the management plan is for these the easements are forever. The management plan is intended to be a periodic upgrade for vision. Um, so as we learn more, we can we can change that management plan as conditions change and change the management plan. The key with the management plan, I think, is you know every management plan is going to have some stated objectives. In it. And you take your best shot at saying what the appropriate objectives are and then try to match an appropriate monitoring methodology or set of indicators to that, right? So um, to your question, the conversation comes back around and says, all right, here's what our objective was. What does the information qualitative and quantitative say about that objective? We may gather information that we can include you know what, we really can't even answer that objective with these sorts of monitoring, so we need to do something different. But you know, you're gonna have some sort of conversation, so what we try to do is keep the conversation tied back to that objective. So this is what we agreed upon to do, to meet these bigger goals. Here's the shorter term objectives. Here's how we're gonna monitor it. Here's what the information says. You know, so it, it's an attempt at least to be above, completely above board, not try to flip anything around the side, look honestly at, well, did we meet it or not? If we didn't, why not? Was it something in our control or something out of our control? You know, so when, when you say we, it sounds like you're talking about everyone at the table, Collective, yes. collectively. Yes, with the land of, absolutely. Like we're a team and yeah, yeah, absolutely. we're all yeah. trying to structure Yeah, we yeah. structure the objectives yeah. together, we decide on the monitoring, some of it's on their court to collect and compile the information from this. So I'm sure we could go on, and I and, and I invite people to stick around for a little while. I forgot to ask my question. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, and Jan Homan snuck out of here. Next Tuesday, Jan Homan's going to do a thing on fall birdie. Okay. Birdie. 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 And Jan Homan, as uh, as you said, is our kind of resident naturalist. Premier naturalist. She's and, volunteering uh, at the museum, so why she slipped out. Oh, is that why she yes. slipped out? Well, you tell her we have her back for. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it, it'll be a it'll be a great program, and I've asked her to spend some special time on migratory birds because this is the hundredth anniversary of the Migratory Bird Act. Mm -hmm. Who knew? How many people knew that it was the hundredth anniversary? Of <laughs> anyway, somebody said that. I thank you very much, Jeff, and then we'll turn on the lights and hang around and look at the photos.